why do we have this survey of AIS? Basically, for you to meet the AIS faculty, you need to see what research we do in AIS. And what you are going to have here is how many faculty? Nine faculty? Uh, yeah. And Professor Schaefer confirmed? Uh, no, he didn't confirm. Did you email him? Yes. Yeah. So probably our ex Dean Schaefer, too. He did it last year and he does this uh, belief function stuff that he invented. So it's pretty good. Okay, and so that's the, the real purpose of this seminar. Uh, for you that are counting on AIS, uh, a lot of the research in AIS bridges over to accounting or starts in, a, in AIS that goes accounting. Things like tax mining, now a mainstream uh, accounting, and started in AIS. Now we are doing all this deep learning research. We expect deep learning to be part of financial accounting. And so it's, it's really a field, but there's a field eclectic because financial, managerial, uh, even with tax implications. Um, and so I will teach, I think, two of the seminars. Uh, and then what I want to tell you is a little bit about the research in AIS and uh, <coughs> <coughs> Ciao, I'm going to ask you, I don't know what happened, but the mark, oh, the markers that I had, I think Andrea expropriated them. Would you mind going and asking Barbara for a couple of markers sure. so you can use the blackboard? So before I start, you guys tell me what is AIS and what is what is AIS research. So what do 
you think does having data first is it true increasing data accessibility is that true or not true true what is increased data accessibility what is increased data accessibility uh, the big data now uh, the technology that allowing us to uh, a little bit louder my ears are totally plugged with my code uh, usually anyway like with all the big data now big data high and uh, okay but even the, before big data when it was just data I mean the moment uh, we started getting magnetic records and etc that accessibility now I have a question for the accounting students when is Accounting start. Oh, you are easy, Logan. That's easy. <laughs> okay. You know, I was just talking this morning. Um, he is now Philip. Easy to remember. And we have June here. June, that I that was very easy. June, August, September. <coughs> But June decided that her name is Cindy. And no one knows her as Cindy. Everyone knows her as June. After seven years here. So she's back in China. Actually, she's not in China. She's mid-year AAA meetings, uh, spending a month in the US. So I'll be seeing her day after tomorrow. Uh, but everyone kind of knows that. Back to this, where did accounting data start and why? Hey guys, you are the accounting expert. Don't, don't ask Abby to answer. You guys are the accounting experts. Uh, I just don't know my name is right here. It's simple in You know, people talk about not about accounting method developed by, oh, you're going to hear from Chow about this, Fra Luca Pacioli. who wrote a book called Summa <coughs> Mathematica. And this was 1492, and an Italian monk. And he basically said that double entry is a mathematical thing, and formulate the thing in mathematical. Then he gets a credit for inventing uh, double entry accounting, but that's not true. Actually, double entry accounting was being performed by Venetian traders much before that, and he just summarized it. But uh, that's kind of the modern accounting model. And I was at a, one of the AAA conferences many years ago, and there was a historian there. And he was talking about things like that. Designs on the cave to keep the inventory of cattle when they started managing to keep cattle, ties in the rope, kind of for writing. And he was arguing that most writing was developed for accounting. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, but uh, let's suppose you are a Venetian mer merchant or something of that kind. What kind of records and why do you keep them? Why do you do accounting? She said, Good example. Keep track of inventory, correct? Tie a knot in the rope for every cow that you have. A well, lot of cows is going to be a long rope. OK. 
okay, keep track of how many babies the cow had. Babies, no? What time? Okay. Um, so inventory is one thing. Is that it? Or, uh, the different events. What? Revenue, expenses, okay. profit. Okay, figure out how much money you make. Yeah. Okay? So, count inventory. Never you. What are the other very old things that people can? A little bit louder, Louis. Tables and simple. Money you owe and money. Oh, that! Yes, I was waiting for that. Um, so, inventory for trade, earnings, revenue, debt, what else? Like, you see, the, the money that you owe, like, you... So, that both ways. Yeah, both ways. Uh, collectible, etc. But uh, there yeah. are some other more interesting measures that develop. Um, don't you sometimes say, you are my partner and we do this together? A partnership agreements. Like yeah, partnership agreements. And maybe not shares yet at that time, but people do. Did joint ventures say, we go and sell, sell this cow, half goes for you, half goes for, for me. Okay, so ownership. And there is one more. No, I call it corporate, but it's organization ownership. Uh, also, don't you keep track besides inventory of assets you have? Shells, yes. Property planted equipment. Okay, or you know you have three hammers, you have three of those things that you hit people in the head, you know, uh, except three bows and arrows, or two, one arrow and 50 row, uh, bows, uh, except. So property pattern equipment. Now I and E made a deal and I give him 10 cows, and he goes straight to sell it. And we are partners. So I need to know not only how much he sold it for, but how much it costs me to replace my cows. Cost of goods sold, correct? And that cost of goods sold has the other concept associated with it, which is profit. because of the Venetian traders and then uh, foreign empire, etc., became pretty sophisticated in trading uh, all over the world. And you know, in the, uh, in the 14, late 1400s, the Spanish Armada went out with uh, ships. And those ships are sometimes just ownership of the queen, but sometimes they are just uh, profit ventures that uh, several people got together, gave money, and uh, were expecting to steal a lot of gold from South America. Correct? And the, the gold came back. You know, there was a major inflation in Europe. Oh, you remember that, correct? Yeah. Major inflation in Europe because too much gold came in. Let's see what happens with Bitcoin. That's going to bring a lot of inflation. 
Okay, but actually this, this generated the need for getting a feeling if um, the numbers you're collecting were correct. Do you know where the word auditing comes from? Huh? Do you know? It's from Latin, uh, auditory, listening. And it's because uh, in, uh, uh, in Rome, public accounts were read in public. The accountants read how the government was spending them. They were taxing, so they had to account to the public. So they would listen to the accounts, audit them. Um, but on the continuing, so actually the double entry system was developed for what? Yes, to improve the accuracy of accounts, to make very sure that uh, that when sales were recorded, there was something in inventory too, uh, ex uh, receivables, payables, that kind of thing. And uh, to increase the accuracy, and if, how do you realize things are not accurate? It's because they're out of balance. Things don't add up, okay? And, the basic accounting system, so this is published in 1492, if I recall correctly, the year, has not changed <coughs> up to today. Has it? It has changed? Some of those are changed. Like what? You don't have it cash anymore? No, that was a that was a unified form for is it for unified form for audit, but for assurance, but it's kind of different. It's like the subject that we are assuring right now is giving much more broad and more details. The form that is needed is a little bit different. I think we need to have the discussion a little bit later in this question, but you are I think the right track. Yes. Um but are we still doing double entry? And do you still teach in introductory accounting weeks of double entry? What? <laughs> they still do. They still have every chapter that is how to book these transactions, etc. And how many people do bookkeeping entries these days? Everyone. Yeah, but much less than before because it's not people who do it. This is all computer software, and the only things that are done bookkeeping manually, except in very small enterprises, is adjusting entries at the end of the bill. Okay, and so, kind of interesting how, how this, have, this has evolved. Uh, so, okay, the next question is, is this question of what is this need, is that a need for audit? Partner, 
okay? In a corporation, there's many, many partners. So him and him made an agreement of sharing profits, and he doesn't trust him. So he hires Abby to come in and assure. Okay, that's one thing. Or he is filing with the government, he needs to pay his taxes, and the government doesn't believe that he's paying his fair share, so they send a government auditor to examine it. So it's a verification for function, typically third party. Okay, my wife tries to audit me all the time. <coughs> but that's not uh, the other. My wife used to work with Coopers and Libraries. And Coopers and Libraries is Price Waterhouse Coopers, PWC. Okay, so she has this habit of being an auditor. Uh, she audits the dog. You saw the dog in the beginning, he gets audited. It's <laughs> just joking. Uh, we have a rule. Any joke I say about my wife and my kids cannot, you see guys, cannot be transmitted to my wife. <laughs> the kids have good sport, they don't mind. But my wife, well she doesn't carry it. But uh, my wife, uh, yeah. so actually, I'd like to, in the articles I write, say auditing, Accounting is the measurement of business, <coughs> and audit is the assurance of business. And I typically say assurance is a big umbrella of which one little piece of it is the standard audit. And that's what he was talking about assurance being a wider function, but is a function of verification. Okay, so the whole idea of audit is measuring the measurement. Now, you all heard about the PCAOB, correct? Okay, now the PCAOB has an inspection program. And what is their inspection program? They check if external auditors are doing their job. And so the PCOB is actually an auditor, because inspection program is an auditor of auditors. That's what the inspection program means. Uh, and they have an internal quality control function, and so those are the auditors of the auditors of auditors. Huh? Internal, internal they have. But we actually are negotiating uh, with the PCOB uh, running an analytics uh, set of posters for the inspectors. Helen, me, and Andrea, I guess, and Kirsten. So, uh, because they want to learn more about how to use analytics. And we are desperately trying to get you in, to become a fellow of the PCOB because they have this, they run 600 inspections a year and we want to look at the data. And you have to be a fellow to use the data. So we are trying that very desperately. If you were here when Catherine Schiffer came, um, her school, has been, has had several fellows over there. They have a very close relationship with the PCP. And last year, um, we had like eight interaction. I was six times at the PCOB. Helen and me did a course for, for them. Uh, I did another course for them there. And they came here with the gate with several people. So we're also dealing with a with the PCOB, but haven't managed to, to, to use that data. And how we want to use that data very badly. Uh, now, how long ago has have computers 
existed to use accounting. Remember, they say most writing was developed for accounting purposes. Maybe that's exaggerated, but it's, it's not too exaggerated. Meaning, uh, physical recording means uh, of wealth are more important to people than art in general. So probably writing on caves and cuneiform writing and etc. had business purposes. And I think a lot of people are finding that, that uh, in the research historians. But um, when did computers come into being? Second World War. Yeah. Well, those computers are huge, and they're not. They certainly oh, were huge. It's calling me old here. You know, I <laughs> I assembled I assembled one of the first computers in Brazil. You know, we don't know that for sure. But I was a, a engineering student at Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and they had someone comes into our class and says, first or second year student, and say, does anyone here speak English? So I went up go like this, very quietly. And I didn't speak regular English, but I couldn't be totally fluent in English. And they had these boxes that they need to assemble. And Bergs, who was the manufacturer, didn't know how to assemble them. So someone needed to read the manual. So we finished up three engineering students assembling a Bergs 205, first computer in Brazil, so both of them. Uh, and it was about twice this room, maybe difficult to judge, had 8K memory. Okay? And uh, you know how you program that thing? 8K? You know what 8K is? Huh? Oh, it turned on. It was hot and full of vacuum tubes. You walked in, it was well, very hot. They realized in the air condition, etc. Okay. And the way you communicated it, it was by paper tape. Okay. And when you made a programming mistake, you put scotch tape on the on the paper tape, and they had a little metallic thing with the place where the holes, and with a needle, you made a hole. Don't laugh. And uh, then they had these boards where the switchboards. And so computers have these registers where you put numbers and commands, and they were on the screen in lights. And you could actually turn the bike on and off with a switch. Zamil, have you ever heard of this? How these computers worked at that time? Yeah, I think. Yes. And so what was that? And one of my happiest days of life was the day that they came in with formula translator, Fortran. And so you could have a, a program that wasn't all zeros and ones. <laughs> so it was, uh, was pretty good. But, and by the way, the original digital, let's say electronic computers, electric computers, were really in the late 30s. Okay? And where they made the first big first mark was University of Pennsylvania, uh, assembled a very large computer and helped in the Second World War effort uh, calculating ballistic trajectories. And this was done before by, they call Wax Woman or Siri Corps, and they were calculating tables for you to shoot your cannons with wind this way and wind that way and etc. And these machines were, it was called the INIAC. And uh, it, this machine had some uh, very good computational capabilities compared with people doing it in hand. Okay, and then a little bit after that, um, uh, the war finished and they created commercial ventures uh, for the purpose of using computers in business. And things like IBM were created. IBM existed and uh, was for uh, business machines. And so they kind of started. It's a very nice story. If you're interested, uh, there are a pile of books telling you, telling you the story. Uh, <coughs> 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 
about that. But uh, then they came in with magnetic tapes. And magnetic tapes had the ability to put a lot of tape on the tapes, and you could read it in, instead of punching cards or punching paper thing. And it was much more practical. And typically what you would do is load the computer program into memory, and when the program was sitting over there, it would read the data in and spit some results out. Uh, and these were called batch machines. They went in batches of data. Um, and with paper, with magnetic tape, you could put a lot of batches together and run them. Uh, and then there was this major transformation thing. Uh, there is a reason I'm telling you this way. Uh, this major transformational thing, uh, whereby very repetitive processes were going to start to be automated. Okay, so for example, uh, you have a utility selling electrical power in New York City, 10 million people. Okay, maybe less at that time. So you would have to issue a million utility bills. So what would they do? They would do it by hand. Have someone go to your house, look at the meter, and then do it by hand, the same kind of thing. And you know, I was, at that time, I had graduated, and the moment they discovered I could do computers, uh, I immediately was drafted in the power company. I'm a power engineer. So in the power company to help them with the computers. Um, and they, they, by that time they had uh, IBM 1130, which had uh, maybe 100 times more memory, which is not very much. Okay, now 800K, please, not even one mega, so et cetera. And uh, what I did there was short circuit calculations. The power company had these power lines, all over the city of Rio de Janeiro. And if a light, if a branch fell in a, uh, on top of a power line and shorted the two, there would be an explosion, correct? So they had to organize the switches to, ex to turn off with a certain level of power. If I was calculating that right, and I wrote four turn programs to calculate that. And we used to measure the power lines, they were in a map. And there was this little device, like, looked like a little bicycle, but it was one wheel, and you would measure the length with those things. And then with the length and the thickness of the wire that you had on the table, you could calculate the short circuit at the different points. And what big innovation, managing to calculate this with a computer, instead of spending hours doing it by hand. Um, and I developed this device and it was basically transparent paper. And knowing that, and we had several, I had, I had several of these transparent papers for wires of different thickness. And I could just put it on top of the map and I, I knew exactly what the result was because I had pre calculated. I just had to move the, the paper. I thought I was great innovation. No one else was particularly interested. <laughs> they thought I was a little bit crazy. And then, uh, Meaning, I, 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 my senior year, well, in Brazil is five years engineering. So in my fifth year, I worked at Rio Light and Power. And then I got accepted to MIT. And I had until September. So I worked like 17 months at Rio Light and Power. And my whole intention was to come back to Brazil and work in the power company. But MIT was fun. And I spent all my nights, instead of being in the business school, I spent it in the electrical engineering department became the computer science department. And you know, you would go, and then they had an IBM 3640, which was about a thousand times bigger, okay? And all Kardec, so you would sit over there, give your back and wait three hours later until they give you a printout. And if you make a mistake on one card, you have to wait three hours and fix the card and then take it back, wait for another three hours. I spent all my nights there, and my girlfriends went crazy. Did you hear girlfriends? <laughs> uh, but was, and they had a new language called PL1. And so I learned PL1, language developed, I think it was at Stanford. Um, 
and was better, much more symbolic and etc. And so I wrote my thesis at MIT, master thesis, they do master thesis at MIT, on inflation accounting. I wrote computer programs to adjust inflation statements, accounting for inflation. And appendix was all these PL1 programs. I don't think my advisor had the faintest idea what I was doing. But it was nice. It was very nice. OK, but there is a reason for the story. The story is I start, I, I did there all these adaptations, first in the physical sciences, short circuit computation, and then I started applying it to accounting. And my question here is, has increasing data accessibility altered the accounting profession? I want to hear you guys to tell me what, why, and how. I would say yes. Yes, because uh, now we all agree. Yes, yeah. but how and why yes. and etc. For example, auditors they need more now, uh, uh, like computer science work background and uh, technology. You know how to It's <coughs> not only we are graduated from the nineties or two or three. So there, there are a lot of information needs um, that arise. But what are the biggest accounting information needs? What is the biggest thing that you need in accounting that computers provide? Hint, hint. Tapes, magnetic tapes. It's storage. Okay, you're already going much farther. I love your dogs, by the way. Do you have it or this is just decoration? What was that? Do you have dogs like that? Oh, no, no, no. It's just a change. I love them. They have Dobermans. Doberman pictures. Did you know that? They are Doberman pictures. Those are, are my nightmares. <laughs> they actually, they are very nice <laughs> in general, but, but yeah, they could be fierce. OK, so storage, correct? Meaning in old days, to find a piece of data, go to the file cabinet, open the file cabinet, piece of, pick a piece of paper, and you only have a few records that are accepted. And you know, why did they, IBM and Burroughs, to start with and then, uh, let me to then, um, started doing magnetic tapes? Because you pick up and you could record there uh, in a magnetic tape, let's say, 3 million accounts expenditure in energy. And then you would run that to the deck and you finish up with nice printed bills. And you didn't have to one by one enter it by hand. They, hired, they fired hundreds of people in that, in what we call natural applications. And the first natural applications were all accounting applications. I kind of record keeping, billing. Okay, real life and power that I was fired a lot of people or moved them to other region because you didn't have to do that repetitive work. And so the real, the real kind of First usage was storage and repetitive work. But it didn't go to that. And then I told you I did inflation accounting for no I made really use it. But um, I started doing analytic computations so I could inflation accounting adjust hundreds of statements if I had the source data. Okay, and so it's not only storage, but analytic type of applications. Um, and this is from the beginning, so this whole set of development. So why did accessibility became easier? Because it just was very easy to read the data. Okay, and you could use it over and over again, and you didn't have to go to file cabinets, and you didn't have to have massive labor to repeat the, the most repeatable. And when you measure the habit pile of measure studies, 
looking at business efficiency, those massive elimination of uh, labor really save money to companies, save a lot of money to companies, uh, created some social turmoil because people lost jobs. By the way, this talk, people lost jobs, gives you any hint for today? Automation. That's right. And they talk about that in the chat, intelligent taking jobs away. Uh, that's probably 10 years or 15 years, but uh, maybe a little bit shorter. But today is really, we are getting better at automating menial tasks. And that's what uh, we call RPA. I don't like this terminology. RPA stands for, anyone remembers? Robotic Process Automation. That's the terminology. Uh, but, but, you know, imagine robotic little robots running around. But actually what they are doing is the old computerization or time and motion studies, the famous researchers in production engineering, or Taylor and Fayol. And what you think about is Henry Ford. Okay, Henry Ford picked up a factory making cars and that was totally artisanal and looked at the processes and organized it that instead of you going to the car and adding a piece, you to go to a production line and everyone did the same thing. And actually that's what RPA is doing these days, is trying to <coughs> organize, <coughs> organize and systematize um, oh yeah, I systematize uh, what you do in order. I lost this guy. That's what I'm looking about. Um, and so, if you, all you, you know Andrea, except maybe the three of you. You know Andrea? Rosario? PhD student in AIS, third year? Maybe fourth year already? Yeah. Andrea is working with me in three projects with different CPA firms uh, in robotic process automation. Every one of the firms is talking about robotic process automation. In reality, it's not really robotic process automation. It's old process studies and organizing. Hey, you are visiting? No, I came here to bring goodies. Bring what? Goodies. Oh, goodies. Problem. For your class. Oh, thank you. Hey, wait, I want to introduce you. <laughs> you guys know Professor Helen? Yeah. Of course. Hi, guys. Uh, when you eat this delicious thing here, Denise made one of our Denise. <coughs> 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 think about <coughs> Denise and think about Helen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Am I allowed to have one too? You can have all of them. How are you? Doing? You didn't get my cold, did you? No, I had mine. You know. Oh yes, you had it. Marina is sick like a dog. Oh, so is Ronnie. Oh, Ronnie is sick. Your fault, my fault. Yes, that's what he said. He said it's my fault. Yes. So, so I teach so, at You know, she's going to be teaching you yes. twice, correct? Yeah, cleaning and content. We just have to figure out that. There are lots of cookies underneath, so make sure you take a look. If Abby doesn't eat every one of them, I can't believe Abby them. just taken one. Eat will eat the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't eat. Very virtual now. He uh, lost. How many pounds did you lose? Uh, like he lost 17. Wow. 17 Consistent kilos surgery. is 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Double uh, and add 10%. Wow. That's why I'm giving these cookies away. But I caught, I, I, caught him, I caught him. He was next to the machine <laughs> looking at the Look at the French fries there, at the fries. and I, when I look at it, I feel guilty and, and then buy it. Yeah. But see, that's the thing, you look at it, and then you walk away. Yeah, that's the most, you know, the, you know. <laughs> Denise made them. So if there's any leftover, give them to eat. 
Oh, you can bring it to the 6 o'clock class. Yeah, bring it to the 6 o'clock class. He's my TA. Yeah. 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 Just want to lose more weight, right? Yeah, yes. You're going to make it work, huh? Eve, Eve and I are going to lose weight together. He's going to tell me his secret. <laughs> See you guys. I spoke. I just spoke to Pat also. Oh, what's well, good? Yeah. Yeah, I talked to him yesterday again. Yeah. So, good. Yeah. So, can I tell them? Uh, well, I don't know yet because they, they, it was just kind of like an interview, I think. So, um, I don't know something. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. All right, no, but it's good. good things, right? And also, yeah, he invited me to the panel in the Oh, in April, right? In April, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he sent me the date for the Yeah, I have to make sure I'm on the list again. I have to contact Rick. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't get myself on the list. Now I'm invited every year. Right. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good conference. All right. Thank you very All much. Fun. We have to, everyone has to send the knees also. Thank, thank you. Thank you, yes. So Professor, Professor Brown Libert will be teaching two of your seminars. Actually next week. Now the following week is she's teaching you. No, no, the following following week. No, no. I'm mixing up. That's the audit seminar. This one she's teaching her own thing. When is she teaching? Uh, Professor Helen. Hmm? Professor Helen? Yeah. Oh, that's okay, you have the syllabus, you know. <coughs> <coughs> but they teach the EIS behavior accounting stuff. Okay, a little bit more about, about So what do we conclude <coughs> about that accessibility has totally changed accounting, but the basic methods have not evolved the way they should.
your girlfriend access is a break in. Okay, just a minor kind of thing, no big danger, and etc. But there could be a Russian hacker sitting over there collecting data slowly that have managed to get entrance in the more secure parts of your application, and you have no idea that has been there. Okay, so it's impossible to do a point in time opinion. Um, say, as of December 31st, uh, the financial statements fairly have not been broken in. That cannot be done. Uh, and it should not be a zero one opinion, it should be more like a graduation type of things. Uh, the security is reasonably good, we didn't find a lot of evidence of breakdown and create some type of granularity to this type of thing. But before auditors issue probabilistic opinions, uh, a lot of time will pass. Auditors are not prone to this type of thing. Um, so I think, yes, accountants will have to, we have to worry, particularly auditors, about security. Because if someone broke into your system, changed large number of numbers, your financial results might be materially wrong. And so never you have to do it, the question is what's really good. Between computerized processes. But now the next question has computerized processing changed dramatically? Yes. What were the changes? Can you guys tell me a few changes? Oh, you had said it earlier. You mentioned the word big data. A little bit louder, I can't hear you. Like, basically, before you only could do supervised learning steps or supervised learning. Supervised? Supervised analysis. I'm not sure about the terminology about that. But we have to classify those by using our own business brain, but now they can write that by themselves, like AI or just. Okay, deep learning. You're talking about deep learning. I think the biggest change is big data. And please don't think of big data as everyone mentioned in big data. Just think about large quantities of data. And the large quantities of data are not only internal, are external too. And we call it endogenous, exogenous variables. Endogenous are variables and data that you generate internally. Exogenous is social media, weather, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these two things are to be used for measuring business and for assuring business. Uh, so one is big data, a lot of data. And what else besides big data? Data analytics. Huh? Analytics? Yes, analytic patterns. Now, a lot of the analytic methods, like regression, clustering, um, uh, decision trees, et cetera, et cetera, uh, have been in the literature for a long time. Why are they so prohibited now and were not so prohibited 15 years ago? Yes, you can do much more with the data, and you have much more data to be done. And I always talk about, about two factors. about 
AI, are, you are thinking about the little robots, very intelligent, going around and being funny. And actually, the algorithms themselves, uh, analytic method algorithms, cannot change very much. We have been talking about what they call neural networks, <coughs> which is not really neural networks, it's an algorithm, a back propagation algorithm. Uh, it has been around for a long time, but now you can do what we call deep learning, which is many layers of of neural networks. And instead of having one hidden layer, you have hundred hidden layers, each one working on top of the other. And what you can do today is compute and recompute, compute and recompute the same algorithm a million times that you could do one time before. I went to college and I was doing linear programming and the simplex algorithm was being done by hand. Okay, so every simplex algorithm and calculator could take me an hour. Okay, now they do it in a nanosecond. And, and what you can do is a lot of approximations or a lot of very simple algorithm repetition. All of you use Waze or know what Waze is, correct? You know what Waze is? No. You know what Waze is. You know Google Maps? Okay, Waze is an other Google Maps. But it has a very interesting kind of, by the way, Google bought ways. Um, you turn your telephone on, okay, and your telephone has GPS. And you drive your car, ways, tells the internet, tells ways where you are and how fast you are going. So you have a map of New York City, you know how fast each street is going. So in addition to just having the map and being able to write an algorithm to get there the fast, the sh shortest distance possible, you can write an algorithm that does the shortest distance possible but takes in consideration how busy that street is. So I'm driving back home, I turn Waze every single time on. It's nearly a hobby, I love to, to do Waze. And he said, one time go to Holland Tunnel, the other time go to Lincoln Tunnel. And the moment I turn it on, it tells me what time I'm going to get home. Okay? And it's called group sourcing. What is group sourcing? Is that updated? By other users. His sourcing, his sourcing, my sourcing, all go into the map. And every time he travels or someone else travels in that street, updates the speed is going. And so it can have the same algorithm on distance, but now also say, now this is too slow, go this way. Okay? And so was this a major computational development? was the first data development because made a source of data that wasn't available. Meaning coming back from Long Island, now and then it's totally closed in the midtown area. So I go to the other side. I could never do that, it didn't give me information. Actually turn the ways off, you see where there are accidents. Because they can see where there are accidents. You know what else it does? It tells you if there is a police yes, the police there. Meaning giving tickets. Now, Waze doesn't see it, he sees it. And so there is all these guys that respond to Waze, saying, I saw a policeman, okay? It's funny, but it's, it's true. I am just a, uh, I'm just a, a leech on this one. I don't tell anyone, but I use that information, okay? I don't want to kind of look at myself when I just send a message. But people love to send send message, there is a broken car, there is, uh, there is a policeman, and etc. But actually, uh, the Google Maps algorithm is quite good. But now it's much richer because a source of traffic information happens. And that's called group source. But 
what did I tell on this story? I said that the nature of data processing has changed dramatically. Because just think about the volume of 30,000 people transmitting every few seconds the speed that they are traveling. And that whole information be placed in map locations. And then each one of you are using your ways and calculate based on the real time information what way you should go. So what do they do? They don't calculate all in the cloud in their facility. They actually delegate some of it to your device to save themselves resources and money. And so this kind of uh, uh, lower platform, higher platform device that they, they develop. But in general, the algorithms are not uh, much more complex. It's how frequently you do it and, and what information you get from it. And actually, although I talk about ways on Google Maps is actually a lot of applications really are the same story. A lot of what they call artificial intelligence is not tremendous superhuman intelligence. Is and, and people say our computers won't become smarter than people. He says, of course. Because we give the data to them, and you get the data from other users, other user, and then you get a lot of users and uh, intelligence and be more intelligent. I think computers are much more intelligent people now. Yeah. Think about think about this. Can you multiply ten digit two ten digit numbers in your head in a thousand of a second? <laughs> Can you look up the database with a million entries in one second? Separate where an auditor has to make a judgment. 
And this part here, we are going to write Excel, or we're going to write Python, or we're going to write R, or some, some code. Okay, it's working. Actually, we have them doing the plotting or the industrial engineering stuff. Okay? And then here in judgment, I we think that there are two types of judgment. One type of judgment that if you get this this kind of variables and Abby get this kind of variables, you would come up with the same co conclusion. The only reason can't be automated is that it doesn't occur very often, so he doesn't know that it's pretty deterministic. And then there are other things that there are too many variables uh, at this moment still needs a human. So we are trying to divide the judgments in what we call deterministic judgments and stochastic unpredictable judgments. And we are going to try to formalize these. But these ones we are going to just create a decision in. So that's what we are doing. I think I, uh, we're doing with Cole Domestic, and we are doing it with a company called Genova. Genova is very small, but not tiny. And uh, Cole Domestic is one, is like number 11. Okay, and we are also working with Deloitte Spain, uh, which is, you know, the big firms here has the whole advisory services, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, they're engaged. But I, I think actually this effect of automation, because of the change of the nature of data processing, is quite feasible and what we are trying to do there. Okay? And so do you understand what the word feed forward is? Feed forward? Instead of looking back and analyzing data, certain things that happen today, how they are going to affect the future. That's a feed forward effect. And we use a terminology uh, that we call it TPI. And this is kind of how I make up here. Uh, Ahmed is using this, hopefully, in his dissertation. I haven't seen anything, but I expect. TPR stands for technological process reframe. And I'm going to give you an example that makes it easy to rethink about this. Okay, there is a technology now that more and more CPA firms are trying to do. They call it artificial intelligence, not exactly. Uh, but is they pick up large number of documents. The documents are in PDF. Everyone knows what PDF is. You scan them, and then you transform them, uh, extract from the PDF a processable format. PDF is not processable. And then you apply text mining onto it to extract facts. So Ian, Zaukai, Zaukai Ian, is, is doing a context project. And the context project is basically a company has 10,000 contacts from the same template. But in order to do the content, like I worked for at and for so many years, the labs, uh, they have tens of thousands of contracts with telephone sellers. So there is a little telephone seller in Manhattan in Madison Avenue, and for them to sell at and telephones, they have to sign a contract, okay? now. Each contract is a, has different parameters. You get 7%, the other one gets 6.5%. Uh, this one has to charge to sell a minimum or whatever. And so auditing doesn't review all those contracts. It just auditing is a cost-benefit function. And, and if it costs too much to analyze something, you don't do it because the benefits are small. And this whole legislation of auditing came from understanding. This morning I talk about materiality, level of error. You know, trying to get a very small level of error is very costly. So there has to be a trade-off where the benefit stops. And so what, uh, what Ian is doing and what the CPA firms are doing is doing PDF scanning, 
<coughs> transformation in text, and then textual analysis. And what's being done there is looking at their debt banks, looking at leases, etc. And so <coughs> we did technological process, we failed. We said we can do this, maybe we can change the audit and look at contracts that need to be looked at is too expensive to look. So now auditing is going to be different because you will have much better confidence that there is no horrendous contracts there. Or if there are, you're calling attention of the client. So that's technological process we trade. Easily way to explain. A new technology shows up to resolve some problem you have. You can apply the technology in other things. And reframing is rethinking how you do things. You know, in the old days, a few of you studied a thing called process reengineering, hammer's work. Okay? And what was process reengineering? The idea of rethinking how you do a process. And this is technological process reframing. As a technology comes, you rethink a process, in this case, audit. Okay, and so what are the feed forward effects of the profession? And the whole audit has to be retaught. And what's going to happen? The audit is going to be much more automatic, not really. Uh, the audit is going to be much more analytic. And I think that the biggest immediate effect, I don't know how immediate, because you saw, you saw Helen, she is talking with the PCOB, we are talking with the PCOB, we are having a lot of, um, lot of conversations. But typically in an engage, audit engagement, you get the data situation, you pull a sample. And uh, the AICPA has sample tables that are developed based on statistics. But the AICPA never dealt with a sample, sample of uh, 10 million records. Okay? This is not the type of population that existed before. And they, it also allows, depending on the judgment, a judgmental sample. So you pull 40 records. Does it make any sense to pull 40 records as a sample of 10 million? It's absolutely not representative. And this is something I'm having a lot of difficulty to explain. All the auditors. That even our friend Trevor Stewart, okay, he was a Develop regression for Deloitte. Uh, he retired, works with us constantly. Even him is having difficulty. He wrote the tables for the ICPA. Okay, he's a very good statistician, very smart guy. Um, even him said, oh, I don't know, etc. But what actually has happened is that it is not so costly anymore to look a little bit at the full population. It's called full population testing. But you can't do every test. Why can't you do every test? Because you would occupy your computers for the rest of their lives. So you have to be selective. So Professor won't know, and Professor Sue and Professor Douglas who else are developing this man's technology. And uh, I don't like to talk math at all. Uh, Hussein called it exceptional exceptions. And uh, there is a reason why we don't use that terminology. But actually what that does is chooses the risks that are the biggest risks on this population and does a filter. And then has, let's say, out of a 10 million, he finished up with 30,000 items. Now, 
the standards say that you have to examine the, these exceptions, you have to examine everything. So Hussein called it exception, exceptions, and said, we don't examine all of them. We create a hierarchy, a priority of these exceptions, and just examine the high priority ones. And so we don't call them exceptions anymore, we call them notable items. That's the same thing. Uh, etc. But we are trying to convince uh, the PCOB that this is a better methodology than just pulling 40 items and say, oh, there is no error, this is fine. Or if there is one error, just look at the error, take another 20 and do it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we are trying to do. And uh, we have four different uh, data sets we're examining and trying to show this technique technology. In theoretical terms, it's a trivial problem. In practice, it will affect auditing tremendously. Um, and this would be a feed-forward effect, because now you have full population testing. And don't tell me that if I filter based on, let's say, three filters, uh, 10 million items come up with 30 items, I know as much as I would know with 30 or 40 judgmental samples. There is a lot of evidential matter that is created by examining and knowing that 97% of the population doesn't have those three big risks. But the standards don't let you do that anymore, yet. So, develop some technology, develop the, uh, the idea of uh, full population testing, now you have to change the profession to adopt it. That's a feed forward effect. Okay. Um, I want to give you a five minutes break and I want I have asked Chow, because you know, two and three hours of me is too much for you. So I asked Chow to do a little presentation on her cognitive style, cognitive computing work, okay? Which I think is perfect for this class. And then I'll come back if we have time. Okay, so it's five before four, we'll come back, at uh, 10 before four, we start to come back at five before four. Give it just a second break. I also go to a bottle. Okay. My name is Chow. Uh, today I'm going to present you a work that uh, Dr. Basarani and I are working on. Uh, we call it Developing a Cognitive Assistant for the Other Training Response Session. So, uh, in this presentation, first I'm going to introduce the background of Cognitive Assistant Technology. Why we are doing this? What is the issue? Why are we trying to uh, link this new technology to the public domain? And then I'll talk about the framework that we propose to develop this kind of tool uh, as uh, one of the new type of audit division support tool. And then I'll talk, about, talk more about the detailed uh, experimental data we have and how we try to use them to create the initial knowledge base. And in the end, I'll talk about the limitation and the continued work. So first, the other planning brainstorming session. This is a process that is actually <coughs> mandated in the new auditing standards, SAS number 99 and SAS number 109. So uh, in this process, the most important objective is to discuss the susceptibility of the clients, the entity's financial statement to material misstatement due to fraud or error. So it is in the initial stage of the audio planning when the auditors, when the engagement team, they get together to update their understanding of the client and try to see, identify potential uh, risk, potential fraud risks, and see whether there are some issues they can discuss. Uh, so usually the participants of the brainstorming session include the senior auditors, the partner, the manager, and also their uh, like new entry level uh, auditors. One of 
the most commonly used tools, procedures currently used by audit firms is an uh, open-ended form, the checklist. A checklist actually is like a form. In general, they list several items, uh, like uh, basic understanding of the company, or whether they are fraud risks, or whether they are inherent risks, this kind of items to recommend to the engagement team to discuss, but it's very general. And based on our standing, usually they are not, they are not like classified based on different industries or specific to any client. So it's like a general guideline. Uh, the importance of the brainstorming session. It is a very important process actually, because um, studies show that in this process, actually it generates more high quality ideas on fraud risks as a team. Meaning that study shows that when auditors they sit together to discuss the potential fraud risk, actually the, the ideas, the issues that they raised or talked about are more valuable than that than that they just sit individually, individually and think about the potential fraud risk. So actually this is a very important process. And since this is important and for the current tools that firms are using the checklist whether there are some issues and limitations with the current tool? The answer is yes. For the checklist, actually it is a structurally restrictive tool. Meaning that uh, because in this tool, they limit the things that the auditors should discuss during the process. Because there are already some guidance or recommended topics to discuss. So it limits new generation of the potential fraud risk. And it, uh, and it induces some biases. Also, because uh, when they only use this kind of tool, uh, the experience and experts, expertise of the senior auditors, their knowledge cannot be collected during this process when they're just talking. And also, if they want to reach additional external information, like if they want to see whether there are some updates about the client uh, through the news articles or through social media, this kind of information, they cannot reach that in the traditional method. So these are some current issues. So what we can do about it? One solution that we can, uh, we can do, we can help to create a better brainstorming session is developing an audit domain cognitive assistant. So what is cognitive assistant? It's also called intelligent personal assistant. It's actually speech enabled technologies that allow users to input their voice, image, or text. And you respond the tool, the system, will answer the questions in natural language and provide recommendations and also performing some actions. To help you understand, there are some commercial uh, personal assistants that is currently used or we have seen that in our daily lives, like the Apple Siri, Google Now, Microsoft's uh, container, etc., or Alexa. Right? Excuse me. I have a question in the previous slide. Do the standards uh, allow auditors to add new items into the checklist? No. To use checklist? No. Uh, to, to add new items into the checklist. Yes, the checklist actually is a general tool that is created by different audit firms. So different firms may use different different kind of checklist. Yeah, but they they in current technology they basically get a piece of paper or a computer screen and they do the checklist. What she is doing is going to be a smart checklist, correct? Uh, Whereby eventually the checklist gets richer and richer. Yes, but, but it's also different because for the checklist actually to recommend you something to discuss, for example, it said that you should talk about potential fraud risks, right? And there's no answer there. You need to insert whatever you discuss or you identify. And for different audit firms, they will make these slight differences in their different checklists. But for the tool that we propose, you will see that uh, we not only want to recommend to different engagement teams what they should discuss, we also want to provide answers for their questions. So that's the difference. So that's the, that's the idea of cognitive assistance. Uh, actually, for 
for the audit firms, currently, um, all the audit firms actually they are investing a lot of resources into the uh, AI, artificial intelligence technologies, and trying to take advantage of their prior knowledge using this technology. And for example, like KPMG, they are collaborating with IBM Watson to uh, work on the projects on cognitive computing, cognitive services, uh, on audit analytics. And for like Deloitte, they are assembling and integrating cognitive capabilities of, from different, from various vendors into their audit analytics. And like uh, PwC and EMI, they are increasing, increasing their usage of audit platforms and increasing the predictive analysis in their audit processes. However, currently, um, most of the automation, most of the actual application of AI is more of labor-intensive tasks in the auditing and accounting domain. For example, like the uh, document review. For example, there are some already established robot in the accounting domain. They can spring, they can, not spring, they can automatically read like the invoice and they, then they can find the answers in the voices, the numbers, and then put it into the databases. So this kind of automation work from those robots. But there is a huge potential in data analytics through these advanced technologies. IBM claims that um, this technology, AI technology, can be applied in auditing, tax, advisory, advisory and other services because these uh, kind of tasks actually heavily relies on people's judgment. Therefore, the AI technology can actually learn people's technologies, people's behaviors, therefore it can contribute a lot in this kind of task. This shows uh, how cognitive assistant can be a good tool, can be a good support for the audit vision, audit the planning process, audit planning brainstorming. There are some main features of cognitive assistant on the left side. So first is the information retrieval. And this feature can help to provide audit related information for risk assessment. This can be done in a QA system, meaning that we could uh, create a large knowledge base in the cognitive assistant based on financial statements, based on prior audio documents, etc. All these resources can be built in the knowledge base and to provide information retrieval support for the auditors during the risk assessment. The second feature is the recommendation support to provide recommendations on uh, discussion topics and potential risk areas for the auditors, like what they should discuss during the brainstorming, what are the areas that could be more, uh, more risky, the recommendations of the system. The third feature is the adaptive learning. Uh, for the cognitive assistant technology, one important feature is that it has a learning curve, meaning that uh, when more users use the tool, when there are more interactions of the users with the tool, uh, they should be able to collect knowledge and experience from those users. When you search something, it will know what you are searching, and we will collect this information. They will know what are the more important things for this user, so they will feedback, become more and more smarter, become smarter and smarter, and uh, recommend to you more important things.
increase the numbers that we require to discuss. We can put those in the initial uh, knowledge base. On the other part, we can do experiments, meaning that we can ask, for example, here we actually have four experimental brainstorming sessions, meaning that they are like conversations, and based on those simulated uh, brainstorming, so we can extract the knowledge, like what are the things that we discuss. So these other things can be pre-prepared as the knowledge base. And in the later, there should be more and more people using this. So they are training and training again, so more and more knowledge will be collected. Those were through the question and answers of the users. They ask questions, and what they ask, what the answers are found, will be collected by the system. So they will know which ones are more important. So the generic idea is that the thousand partners <coughs> or staff <coughs> PwC using it, every time it uses it, it adds to the knowledge base. So this is a collective engine of accumulated knowledge. So that has been PwC. <coughs> so that has been PwC. So PwC. Oh, it is a PwC, yes. It PwC. Yeah, it is. It's not a problem, not definitely the firms, and I think the legislation, uh, regulation will let it be shared. But the rules today is that you cannot collect data from a client and use it in other clients. <coughs> but anything that you remember experientially, you can use. So this is an experiential collector. And the last one is service education. This is a uh, listening that a cognitive assistant can actually um, link and open to different applications. Like in your uh, iPhone, right? You can ask the weather and it, it will open the weather app and tell you some information. Or like you can set up a timer or a calendar. Therefore, uh, for the audit process, it can help to like link to different audit applications that may be used to do during the audit planning process. So it can. Uh, make the auditors focus more on the risk assessment part. We'll talk more about this later. So this is the proposed uh, audit cognitive assistant framework. We call it Luca. Thank you. Professor already mentioned Luca Petroli. So that's the original idea why we call it Luca. Uh, there's three layers here. The, the top layer is the interface. The middle is the architecture, and in the third part is the background support. So for the interface, we propose that uh, when users, when engagement teams start to use it, uh, they should select the industry, the client, and their own positions. There are two main purposes for this. The first one is the um, data access limitation, meaning that uh, Professor just mentioned uh, for one client, some information of one client maybe should not be accessible for the for the another engagement team. Therefore, we want to do a access limitation based on the selection. And also, the second uh, purpose of this is to help tag and classify the queries or the actions performed by different auditors of different level, meaning that we want to know which questions are asked by senior auditors, which was asked by like, entry-level actors, um, the auditors. And maybe we are more interested in the risk areas that are searched by senior auditors, and we would want to put those into the knowledge base later. So for better tagging and classification, we also want to like, tag them who are doing what in this system. And during, uh, when the user asks a question, when the user asks a question, he can ask by, by talking to it or typing the question. If he is talking to the system, that like how you call the safety, that question, through an automatic speech recognition system, the question will be passed into a text, into a text that the computer can understand. And then it will go to a query classifier. Then the system will decide if your query is a question or an action. If it's a question, then it will go to its QA system, meaning it will try to find an answer for the question. And if 
it is an action, meaning I want to open the calendar, I want to do a calculation, then it will execute the action directly by invoking the applications. And if it's a, um, a, que if it's a question, then the answer will be found and go back to the uh, auditor. Also with a natural language. At the same time, uh, when you ask some questions, it should provide you some recommendations. For example, you are uh, asking about something related to understanding of the company. Then it may say, it may know that uh, you may also want to like talk about some new events or business risks, uh, etc. I will have more classification of this later for the recommendation topics and recommended risk areas. So that's for recommendation. And for uh, the applications, I just mentioned that uh, it can lead to different audit-related applications because currently for those commercial uh, cognitive assistants, some of the linked apps are not actually useful for the auditing, for the auditing process, uh, like the open your calendar or not calendar, open um, set a timer, maybe that is not useful. So here I list a couple of a couple of apps that could be used during the audit planning process. Like, the, for example, the web search. If they want to know something more about the client on their recent event, they can search this, like through Google. This can be linked to the Google Cloud. And like open different uh, standards, templates, or the tools that the company use for analytics. Um, One of the most important part for a cognitive assistant is this knowledge base. What information, what knowledge we want to input in the system. There should be at least three main important parts for building this uh, auditing domain cognitive assistant. The first one is, I want to start with the unstructured data. So any text, if they're from like financial statements, accounting policies, analytical procedures, anything, and or the working papers, anything that could be useful, that auditor may need some information from those files, we will put that as our knowledge. The second part is the domain knowledge, the judgment or experience of the senior auditors. This can be done by experiments or simulated cases. And we want to create this as question and answers, prepare questions and answers. In a, in a traditional relational database so that they are actually prepared and organized. The third type is knowledge of our users. This is through queries and search during the user interactions, meaning that whatever you search, what is more important for this engagement team, those knowledge will be collected. So this is the components of the knowledge base. And here I list um, some of the most important features, uh, the feature models. I think I have introduced some of them. This is from another paper, uh, which shows some of the models, like speech recognizer, right, to understand what you are saying and put it into text. And uh, to understand your language and general answers, these uh, can be implemented into the question answering system so it knows your question and be able to prepare for the answers. And the time of manager is to determine whether it's a link to an action or it wants to find an answer for a question. And text to speech is the idea is simple. So it's put the text into the natural language, go back to the user. So you will hear uh, the, the answer.
about this, but uh, it sounds, it looks um, to me that um, those questions are more like factual questions, and by the sound questions, that is because, you know, judgment or not yet, like, 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 like fact or something. Um,
vertication process for? A uh, vertication? Yeah. Yes, in the, in the beginning, of course, the answer should be verified. And I think in, in the following uh, processes, when we collect more knowledge from the users, those knowledge should be verified first before they finally permanently go to the knowledge base. So it should be verified in a certain process? I think so, yes. I do like the part of the video just said that lab would cut could be a one system that if uh, auditors miss something and uh, the system will the system will warn auditors, right? And are that they're just saying that uh, if auditor probably miss something and uh, this system will also provide some factual information that could probably help aud auditors to make their better judgment. Is that right? Um currently it's more on general topic like uh, there are maybe other risk areas or risk questions you want to ask. And if you actually ask those, then it will give you more information. So it do not, does not want to, to like show you everything in front of you. So you, you have to do whatever it says. So currently it's, it's kind of um, want to drive you something, but also it gives you a lot of freedom to like to what you want to ask. So that's an idea now. Okay. Thank you. But you know, you want uh, your questions to like this thing needs to learn. And I think we need to make it more before it learns. And I think if you raise me a question in my mind that I, 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 I should be thinking about is, let's suppose that this thing has only very elementary capabilities. Uh, like answer a few questions, etc. Interesting question, would that be useful? My suspicion is yes. And I think with the enhancing of capabilities, uh, people get ambition. And uh, I like your definition of that. Um, and this shows um, the proposed initial recommended risk areas and uh, some recommendation topics. For example, in general understanding of the client, you may be interested in this company information management, business structure, etc. And uh, what part of this recommendations should be should based on the audit procedures or programs of that audit firm? And also another part is based on the real user interactions. When it becomes smarter and smarter, so it knows what the other thing that should be interesting for each user. These are the four uh, recommended topics. And QR system is one of the most important things here. And I want to quickly go through for, info, uh, for the QA system. First, the question will be analyzed. When the question goes to the system, the question will be normalized. And the keyword will be extracted, uh, the punctuations, punctuations, et cetera, will be processed so that it will become a query into a, like, into text that is easy to be understood by the system and to find the answer. Therefore, generated query will go to the uh, answer matching module where it will try to identify the answers. There are two types of questions. One part, one part is that we actually have paired, prepared answers for those questions. And we store those paired questions and answer list in our database management system as a, like an Excel sheet, etc. So that paired QA system, if the answers can be found through this type of question, then answers will be generated and go back to the uh, user. This is information retrieval based QA system. Or uh, some, some places call it domain QA system. It's more like register uh, limited type of QA. And another type is you cannot find any answer using prepared questions. And then we will uh, try to use this knowledge based QA or call it cognitive QA. This is the idea of the IBM Watson deep QA system. So the idea is uh, actually you have a lot of knowledge 
files, you have a lot of data sources in those paperwork, in those documents, and you put it into another place. And when you ask a question, it will go to those files using machine learning algorithms to try to find the best matched potential answers. And then documents with candidate answers will be extracted. And then using these candidates, the module will try to find answer with the highest score, which will be selected as the best answer and go back to the user. And also for QA system, we should have uh, classified the questions and answers, how to check them, where to put them. Therefore, here is the initial proposed question and answer categories for the QA system. And here are the things, for example, business understanding is one part. And in the business understanding, there are business, uh, economic factors, weather, etc., and different layers. And there should be questions and answers. To create the initial uh, knowledge base for the QA system, Actually, we use uh, recordings of four brainstorming discussions conducted in uh, the audio forum. And to make it work, actually, we, uh, we, would, we would like to have additional cases. So therefore, we can have more questions and answers to include. These are just uh, uh, the, the data currently we have. There are four different companies in four different industries, and uh, we have the conversations on them, like they do simulated brainstorming sessions. And then we extra knowledge out of it, extra question and answers. After extracting the question and answers, actually we can create a demo, the initial stage for this part, prepared, prepared questions and answers. Therefore, if you ask questions related to those questions, you will find answers out of it. Um, so in the demo, can the robot, this software is actually a free, it's an open platform, it's used. Um, this platform is written with the AIML. It's artificial intelligence makeup language. It's one of the commonly used language currently um, for developing chatbot. So um, the idea is when you ask some questions, if it has the answers there or similar answers, it will go back to you the answers. So that's a little illustration. Use the words. Don't say that this time. Everyone is hungry. <laughs> So we are continuing to work on this and uh, try to develop industry-based recommendation system and develop the knowledge QA system, like better classification and do uh, illustrations and demo. Um, and one limitation is that um, because for any development of the brainstorming uh, of the cognitive assistant, it's always important to have the training data sets to develop the initial uh, knowledge base. So if we can have uh, more cases, brainstorming cases, it will be better for us to collect knowledge of the actual engagement teams. So that's my presentation. So what do you guys think of this?
doing all this investment in deep learning stuff. And those are very big investments and might work on the little area of the audit. Uh, they already found that they have to limit it to a certain degree. And I think a digital assistant, I'll see, to help on the day-to-day -day engagement can be very useful, much more useful than what they are doing. Now, Charles' dissertation is a very high-risk thing, never have been done. And I don't want Chow to get into big development or except. Okay? What are your three chapters? Tell your three lessons. Tell me. Uh, so the first one is the uh, framework, and the second uh, is um, the also framework, but with some development of how to actually uh, create a QA system with the knowledge management. What knowledge will be included, and uh, how to organize them for the QA system. So, <coughs> first one, you kind of heard it. This one. Basically, the first has will be difficult to publish, but will be published somewhere. Okay, because anything that you do that's very forward looking is difficult to publish. The second one is actually knowledge organization essential. You know, when I was talking to KPMG, uh, I finished this and we have another problem. And their problem is basically knowledge organization. They said they have huge amount of data stored, standards, this and that. And they can't get it in a way that people can use it. And I didn't say that there, but actually it's a knowledge organization. <coughs> organization and the people problem. And I think what Chow is going to do will be the beginning <coughs> of that solution. I don't think it is the idea that he was asking me the same thing. And I don't want her to, <coughs> to get in any deep prototype. I want a simple prototype that can show some attributes, expectations are the main Because, you know, Developing operating code is for the firm, not for Chow Chow. Okay? Chow needs to show concepts and what can be done. Now, Chow already, uh, Chow complement me on this, but Chow already went out and looked at what kind of public modes exist of software that can recognize voice, there's a big way to responses. You found the QA system. Tell them about the QA and the system. Uh, the name is Open Oxygen, I think. Uh, I, I need to check the, the no, name. No, no, that's okay. Just describe a little bit what, what the thing can do. Oh, the, the thing is actually is it was initially from the IBM was the deep QA system. So the idea is you uh, input different uh, like document knowledge and then try to understand and find an answer for your question. So it's like actually uh, like an initial, initial prototype of the original version of the uh, IBM person. Uh, so actually that one was accessible and it's uh, open to all that kind of use. So this, this is the key word here, open source. Okay, she wants to take little pieces from here and there and use it as a demonstration. And if KPMG comes, I told them we need resources for this. I'm going to hire two or three undergraduate students to try to slap uh, a good demonstration together. If not, I'm going to try to convince child to pretend she's a computer and she's answering some of the questions. Uh, it's a demonstration thing. Uh, but I have to tell you, I think this is the probably most important thing we could do for auditing at this moment. And I don't think any anyone else, well, I don't know. I was in a conference in uh, Baruch College, and this guy, big software development guy, was saying, uh, uh, cognitive aids are the most important firms should be doing. And think about this. They have 
what is it? 2,000 partners. They are working all over the world in engaging us. They're asking the same questions. One knows about the competitor, the other one doesn't. One knows about stores in Canada, the other one doesn't. They don't have an organized way. That's why I said that the knowledge capture is so important, the knowledge organization. They don't have any of this. And they have spent millions of dollars accumulating knowledge bases. Okay, and now there is, you know, you, you guys use Google all the time and Siri, don't you? Does it work? Does it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, what does it work? 10% of the time, 100% of the time, 80% of the time? I would say it depends on uh, what kind of question. Yeah, what kind of question? <laughs> <laughs> like, not the question, it's like if some No, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that's that's, 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 that's why, why when you ask a question, I say, let make the baby walk, not run. Okay, simple questions, uh, but you, you audit at the hamburger stand, you know more about the hamburger stand than he who never audited it. Simple question, that's fine. And you realize that 90% of the people that are auditing multiple stores ask where your stores are. You didn't ask, uh, Chow, why didn't you ask me? Uh, why didn't you ask me where the stores are? Okay, and the next thing will be a whole set of research projects using prototypes to see how this thing will work. But it's, it's very interesting. I expecting this to be an artificial intelligent thing, answering the color of the underwear of someone? Of course not. But this will enhance, you know, the whole audit is like artisanal process. You know, they haven't really industrialized. Meaning, don't go, the camera is on. They haven't really industrialized. Um, and of course, they are doing, maybe they are doing hundreds of thousands of audits a year around the world. And I think the question they can ask in China or in Taiwan are very different in some things. That will be asked in the US, but many of them are the same question. Size of the firm, risk. Um, uh, has there been a lawsuit? What is the nature of lawsuit? That type of questions. Okay. I, I find this very, very important work um, and goes in the range of things, meaning you are doing a market study. Uh, there has been 20 studies done in that domain. You added the variable, right? added the timing, changed the nature of exception of the population. You did a little marginal improvement. It's a reasonably safe environment. What she's doing is highly risky, except her chairman uh, says it's okay to do it. Okay, highly risky, but it's very different and could be the first of 20 dissertations working on this thing. Very interesting. And what do you guys think? I think the system is an integration of a lot of like many kinds of technology. For example, uh, Chow mentioned that if there is no direct answer, it will go to some documents and then extract information from those documents. So, there may be like text mining technology or other related technologies and you need to have a lot of inputs into the system. For example, to find the history of this company, the previous like lawsuits information or the related documents. So I think it needs a lot of work and it's an integration. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work. And I think the secret for shall be happy getting a doctorate is keep it reasonably streamlined. Now she's all over the map with this thing. I think when she progresses for knowledge and for the illustration, she needs to say it will only do little baby steps, this and this and this, and show that those can be done. Okay. Yes. Like information about the industry and 
So the information industry will be a part, and then she said, I will only illustrate it with retail information and uh, with this kind of three things. But I think that when auditors see the prospect, meaning go back to, to Siri. Siri is, Google is very useful. Okay, I was here either this class and the one before, uh, looking at this guy who not the class before, looking at uh, uh, this guy who created smart contracts, Nick Sutter. So I went into into Google and it immediately told me that they suspect that Nick Sabo is Mr. Nakamoto who invented Bitcoin. I didn't know that. Okay, I'm in the field, I, 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 I didn't know that. Very interesting. So she's going, she's going to put the name of Mr. Nick Sabo in there and they will discover that he is a forger somewhere. Okay, this is the kind of thing. It, and you know, I, I like what Abby said because, you know, I always talk about cybersecurity. And I say there is no way to stop cybersecurity attacks. <coughs> and why is it? Because you pick this guy up here, <coughs> okay, you have a chip in there. And the chip has an operating system. And the operating system uses a database. And top of the database, there is an application. And on top of the application, there is an application that uses GPS, which is another application. OK? And when you guys turn your computer on, or in the morning, you are going to see it updated, uh, let's say, Windows or Apple iOS. And then it up updated all these programs that we use without you having asked it to update. So there are what I call piggyback applications in light numbers. Each one of the applications has some what they call zero day faults. What is a zero day fault? It's a fault that no one has identified yet. Okay, have you been reading the newspaper last week? They identified two very serious chip faults at Intel chips that are used in every single computer. And everyone is scrambling to figure out a way, and they think, yes, we can block the fault, but we'll decrease the power of my computer by 30%. Okay? Uh, then the next interesting question is, does the, did the end National Security Agency, NSA, knew about this fault and was already exploring it for spying. Or were the Russians or the Chinese doing that? That's their job, correct? Don't, don't be so bitter. Their job is breaking into other people's systems. Like your job is passing the PhD exam. That's what they're supposed to do. Don't be too bitter and say these are crooks. They're not crooks, they're doing their job. Okay, and the old days when you started computer hackers uh, just did it for the fun of doing it. Today they do it for profit, they do it for this, but a lot of guys do it for, for the fun of doing it. And so this thing that automatic update, they have backdoors. What is a backdoor? It's a piece of software that allows you, if you have the right access, to go in there because they need fixes. Now, how many employees left Microsoft and Apple in the last year? A lot. A lot. Okay, and how many were unemployed after that? A lot. And if they found a way to make money, okay, and just continuing, there is a code. You know, Shao is an example, but code is something that you collect from here, collect from there, and put it together. Uh, and if you look at things like Windows, iOS, uh, this is an old piece of software, maybe 10 years, that went through Windows 1, Windows 2, Windows 3, and you keep updating the thing. You don't rewrite the code. So anything that was a fault there continues being a fault, and now you add the new ones. And then you found this little cute code on the internet 
that's how programmers work. Put it in. You didn't realize, you know, they had he had twenty thousand lines of code. That's small. Um, you couldn't even verify it one by one. You just tested it. So don't tell me that cybersecurity will be resolved. It's a multi-layer type of thing. Uh, most of the things you can do in software, you can do in hardware and vice versa. <coughs> so <coughs> hardware code we have faults just like software. And they just started finding them. So this is problem we will live all in our lives. And we cannot have think that this is unique to, all, to this particular generation, and we are going to have much more secure code. I actually think we're going to have much less secure code. It's just, you know, people are the very, you know, just think about Charles' code, okay, in chapter three. She's going to pick it up from here, pick it up from there, pick it up from there, and be very happy if it works a little bit. She's not going to go and start verifying if it has cyber security. Right? And then people will go into the code and, and uh, if it's public or somewhere, and they are going to say, oh, this looks like that thing that I used before. Oh, I kind of know where it is. And the hackers are going to say, well, I see this pattern of code here. This is something that I identified. The NSA has already been leaked and passed over that code to everyone. You know, a lot of these attacks now are coming from leaked code that the NSA had developed for, you know, they are doing their job, trying to attack the Russians and whoever they attack. Okay? Um, no bitterness of this. This is, uh, this is the name of the game. Yeah. Because you 
once you put the answer in there about Nick Sabo, everyone can find it. Okay, so it's uh, uh, as big as the database finishes are being, the multiple queries. Even how have you thought how many in times a day you query Google? You query Google a lot. And most of the times, despite of each skepticism, it does answer, correct? You know, if you say what is the meaning of life, you know it's not going to answer very well. But if you're asking what time is now in Beijing, you know pretty much he is going to answer. And you might actually know that, uh, understand that there are 10,000 people that ask that question every day. So it's going to be this whole range of things. And I think the CPA firms need to accumulate knowledge. And they are doing it with big data. Not the knowledge base that don't work very well out of the working papers, and they need another way. It seems that Google, the firms are very worried that Google will go into their business and replace them. They're very worried that auditing will, Google or Apple will try to become the. I don't think so. I think that uh, this is a very small business for those guys. CPA firms are not a big. Yeah. So it will be. Very, very interesting. You know, most of our audits are going to be many, and, and the, your students, you know, you guys are all going to be professors. Your students will be every day querying Google every minute in your classes, trying to help themselves, even, even if they are not just checking for the name of a girlfriend or something, uh, they will be asking questions related to the class. <coughs> <coughs> and I think that's the future. It might not be typing in or talking in, might be some other way, but <coughs> cumulative knowledge bases are the question. I, I'm just going to have a, uh, have a 10 minutes. <coughs> so I talked about, about what I said here is really what I said here. Never forget that accounting not a procedural thing is a way of measuring business. And maybe the whole model that we today just look at financial statements is, is really ultra pass, ultra pass, passing. Why? Because uh, how many people learn their business from their financial statement? When Fraluca, Pacioli, and the Venetian uh, merchants were there, they were using financial statement because the things they have to measure is the things that are specified here. But today, businesses are much more complex. They run their business out of their ERPs. And there, there is human resources, there is intellectual property, there is production, there is brand, there is all kinds of things that they measure. And so if you're using that information to run your business, your stockholders should know some of that information too. So I think the measurement, and there is now things like um, integrated reporting, uh, sustainability reporting, and they are becoming very big. Uh, and uh, I think that eventually the businesses will be required to report that way. And uh, the audit is not going to be, Professor Palmer usually talks about one size fits all model, financial statement, balance sheet. He says, no, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be measure different things and try to measure the things that are relevant for your stockholder. They could now call those things non-gap measures, okay? But that's the direction that things, things are going to go. Or if that doesn't happen, financial statements will be abolished. And they, they are meaningless. You know, today, you look at the balance sheet. People only actually use these things. If you think of, no one uses owner's equity because what is the number? Or intangibles, no one uses that stuff. Bad measures. Uh, cash, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Inventory to a certain degree is usable. Property, plant, and equipment, useless. I mean, straight line depreciation in 10 years means what? 
Okay. Um, and then, then isn't the worst question. If these numbers are so bad, uh, audit, what's the value of auditing them? Okay, and then I, just to, uh, to aggravate the thing anymore, I think that if you talk about numeric obfuscation, the worst is consolidation. Because most large businesses have several lines of business. And adding a retail store to a manufacturer gives you nothing. Okay? And when they started with the XPRL, I went to the XPRL Pennsylvania meeting, and I argued strenuously, say, create an XPRL standard that collects transaction data. And let the stockholders accumulate the data however they want, use the data however they want. That's what a lot of analysts say. Don't cross up the data. But of course, businesses don't want to give you that data. And I think my students ask why. And I say, do you like to be graded? Do you want to be graded? You're getting this bonus based on uh, basically net income. And you can manipulate it. Financial statements, standards allow to do a lot of manipulation, do straight line depreciation. You do the accelerated depreciation, you take lifetimes, you predict, you predict returns on your pensions, all of these things you can for a while manipulate legally. Okay, just make judgments. And more and more of fair value measures are all judgmental. Totally, totally judgmental. Um, and so we, we have a, a, a very mobile situation whereby uh, if we if we are going to still give third-party investors some feeling about, about how the business is doing so they can be done. But again, management doesn't want it. Do you blame them? Of course not. If you can administer the benchmark that you're going to make money and make your money better, why are you going to give information to this young lady here to say you manage your inventory horribly and your personnel is turning over and you're losing all the smart people and you are cheating people in China? Why would you do that? The cheating people in China maybe is an overstatement here, but the other part is, you know, give my, my son is an analyst in a long-term investment fund group does very, very well. And my son looks at those numbers. He doesn't use any of these things that I'm talking about. He looks at numbers, visits the company, looks at the newspaper to see what newspapers say of the company, uh, uses some services of tax mining, and that's what they do today. But the distance between publishing, oh, and the other thing is the thing I mentioned before, I don't think you on the other one, is <coughs> 75 to 80 percent of all trades are algorithmic. Another 10 percent or so is uh, index fund adjustment, because you buy index fund, and the index fund has to report, has to be like the index, so you keep buying and sell stock to keep, keep with the index. Okay, so old fashioned trading, 10 percent of all volume. And if you are doing real-time trading, 80% of the volume, you want to trade every second. You don't want to trade every quarter when they issue a financial, quarterly financial statement, which adds your retail to your farms and to your medical practice and to your bank, which means absolutely nothing at the end. So now, you know, this is research. And you know, you guys should see, particularly the three of you, should see Baruch Lev's book. Baruch Lev is a professor at NYU. It's called The End of Accounting. Okay? And he basically, in the first five or six chapters, he does market tests and show that if the influence of uh, financial reporting is more than 5%, it would be surprised. And then in the second part <coughs> of the book, <coughs> he, he shows certain industries 
that have a board in things like patents and oil reserves and etc. etc. And he argued for non gap measures, basically. Um, and then, of course, we, if the numbers are so bad, what's the purpose of auditing? Now, there is one purpose. In the Security Act of 33 34, before that, where companies needed to be audited, there are companies trading in the stock market that didn't exist. Just some guy issued the stocks, like it's happening now, now with ICOs, individual, uh, what is it, individual currency issues or initial currency uh, off, ICOs, in initial currency offers. Okay, so people invent a new Bitcoin uh, to finance their company. We had, do you remember that, Chow, in the conference we had this guy, uh, the second blockchain company, and he was going to issue $20 million in, uh, in his own currency to finance his business. And that's what people are doing. I have a nephew in Brazil who is creating a hedge fund for electronic currency in the Bahamas. Okay? And so that's crazy. That's totally, totally uh, nuts. Uh, but you know, uh, so if you at least know the company exists, it has a building, there are people working there, it's a bank, it's an audit bank. Okay, it deters certain problems. So I, I do think there is a little value for audit, even if things change very much. And, uh, but I don't know, I don't know. So this is kind of the measurement stock. I have another three or four minutes. Um, so let's talk about analytic methods. Um, and then this is actually the problem. Accounting is delivered by reporting. The reporting standards are not very good, or they are terrible, okay? And so don't look so sad. One thing is uh, a lot of employment out of university still goes to accounting firms but more than accounting first, accounting functions. So the measurement of business is essential to run a business. Remember our Venetian merchants. They kept records because you need records to run a business. And the IDRPs are so fantastic is because they collect a lot of data that you can use for internal decisions. So the problem is not in internal reporting. The problem is in external. Uh, and then another thing is an interesting, the AACSB. You know, everyone knows what AACSB is. American Association of Collegiate Schools of Business that certifies MBA programs. They actually are requiring now technology. And they didn't say how, but they are requiring technology. So AIS professors will have a better job. I'll, I'll say another thing. When I graduated at UCLA, a few years when I started teaching at USC, um, I was the first person listed as systems oriented person. Financial, managerial, tax systems, first. Now there are probably 800 to 1,000 of them across the US. And the other phenomenon is you guys might suffer to this. Maybe not if you're not in the US. You might be asked to teach AIS because, oh yeah, from workers you teach AIS. You know, Fatima was never even came close to me. Okay, she had, I think, horror for AIS. And now she is in California teaching. Guess what? And she submitted a paper and for J and I accepted it. She did a good paper. And, on cloud computing and markets, okay? And so, uh, AIS has its own thing. Five journals, or at least none. Okay, that's my granddaughter last year. 